بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having gathered us here on this auspicious night We thank him and we glorify his praises Alhamdulillah thumma alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us iman and he has guided us to this faith Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana li hadha wa ma kunna li nahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah All praises due to Allah who guided us to this and we would not have been guided had it not been for the guidance of Allah. Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Allah guided us not just to this religion, but He guided us amongst many of those who claim to be guided to be amongst those who are standing in prayer tonight. How many other Muslims are there? How many other Muslims are there? They have partial guidance, they are Muslims, but they have not been given that tawfiq to be standing in salah, to be standing in qiyam, to be eager and earnest to be finding Laylatul Qadr. Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose us from amongst the chosen. He chose us from amongst the chosen to be standing here, dedicated in worship, standing up in salah, spending our time in ruku' and in sujood. What a noble act of worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises those who stand up and those who do ruku' and those who do, do, do sujood. وَقُومُ لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ Stand up in Allah in humility. وَرْكَعُ مَعَ الرَّاكِعِينَ Do ruku' with those who are doing Ruku' and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the position of sajda. There is no position that is more beloved to Allah as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said than the position of sajda. And he said, never is a servant closer to his Lord than he is in that position of sajda, in prostration. And therefore, he encouraged us in that position. He said, increase in your dua while you are in prostration. فَقَمِنٌ أَنْ يُسْتَجَابَ لَكُمْ For it is very likely that you will be responded to. Increase in your dua in that, in that posture of sajda because this is the most likeliest posture in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer your du'as. Therefore, I thought what a beautiful opportunity and what a great time to discuss some of the etiquettes and some of the wisdoms and some of the noble manners that we should learn about the issues of du'a, about how to make du'a and what to ask for in du'a. And I thought that instead of giving you a list and instead of discussing, uh, uh, if you like, in an abstract sense, let me link this lecture to a story that all of us have read and heard. A story that is dear and near to all of us and that is the story of our father Adam alayhi salam. Our father Adam and his encounters with Iblis. Let us look at the etiquettes of dua that we obtain through the story of Adam and Iblis. The story of Adam and Iblis is known to all of you. It is a story that deals with the genesis, the beginning of creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam and he told Adam and his wife to live in Jannah and he told them not to eat of this tree. Shaitan out of his jealousy seduces them to eat from the tree and so the both of them are expelled. The one for arrogance and the other for disobedience. And the one is cursed until the day of judgment. The other is repented upon immediately. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives him. This is the story in a nutshell. It occurs in over 10 different locations in the Quran. Now, what do we gain about the etiquettes of dua from the story of Adam and Iblis? We will summarize as much as we can. Inshallah ta'ala have half an hour, I think. <laughs> inshallah, not more than half an hour. We want you to also use the etiquettes of dua in dua while we're praying, inshallah. So we want to make sure we get that done as well. Uh, what are some of the etiquettes that we learned from the story of Adam and Iblis? First and foremost, the fact that Adam alayhi salam made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately when he realized that he made a mistake. Adam immediately made dua when he ate from the tree and his nakedness became apparent to him and he began to cover himself with the, with the leaves of the tree. Immediately he realized he made a mistake, instantaneously, and he made a dua right then and there. What did he say? رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِن لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُنَّنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Oh my Lord, I have wronged. We have wronged ourselves. And if you don't forgive us, and you don't have mercy on us, then of a surety, we will be of those who are lost. So of the signs of a mu'min, 
of the signs of a true follower of Adam, not just a descendant of Adam, but a follower of Adam. All of us are descendants of Adam. But some of us choose to follow the methodology of the Prophet Adam, of the sign of the prophetic methodology. You make dua immediately when there is a need. You don't delay it. When you commit a sin, when you need anything worldly or religious or spiritual, you make the dua right then and there. Contrast this to Iblis. Iblis, Allah tells him to prostrate. He says, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to prostrate. I'm better than him. This is jahiliya. This is, this is racism. I'm better than him because I have a better creation material than you do. My skin color is better. My ethnicity is better. My language is better. We still have the same satanic racism present amongst Muslims to this day. The same satanic racism. I am better than so and so because of where I'm from, because of the color of my skin, etc., etc. So Iblis says, I am better than him. I'm not going to prostrate. So Allah curses him until the day of judgment. Allah tells him to leave. And Iblis in his arrogance refuses, refuses till the very last second until he realizes he has no other alternative and he sees this curse and he realizes he shall forever be cursed. So then Iblis is forced to make a dua. Unlike Adam, Adam makes the dua coming from him. Adam makes the dua instantaneously. Iblis, he only makes dua when all other opportunities are closed, when everything else is shut off. And he sees now there's nothing else for me. Well, let me try making dua. And so Iblis also makes a dua. What is the dua that Iblis makes? Qala anzirni ila yawmi yubathun. Iblis says, oh, Allah, uh, oh my Rabb, oh Allah, allow me to live until the day of judgment. Let me live until the day of judgment. And so right from the get-go, we learn a fundamental difference between Adam and Iblis. Adam alayhi salam has a continual link with Allah. He's always making dua. Iblis, this was the only time he ever made dua. He never made dua after this. The only time, because he's gotten his need. Adam alayhi salam, when he came down to this earth, we know he was a prophet, a righteous man. He continued to worship, he continued to pray, he continued to make dua. So the sign of a believer is constant dua. When you ask man for more and more, he becomes angry at you. But when you ask Allah for more and more, he loves you. I repeat, the more you ask of your fellow man, the more irritated he becomes at you. You don't ask your friends too much because then they won't be your friends too more, too, too, for too long. But as for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you ask Allah, the more Allah loves you. Why? Because the relationship between Allah and His servant is one of servitude. Is that not correct? What is our relationship between ourselves and Allah? It is one of servitude. What does the servant need? Everything from the master. What does the servant require? What doesn't he require? He requires everything. Not just his clothes, his food. The air that we breathe, Allah gives it to us. The life that we have, Allah gives it to us. How can the servant feel arrogant against Allah? How can the servant say, I can't ask Allah this? Who else are you going to ask? Where else are you going to get it from? A sign of Iman is to recognize that everything that you need will only come from Allah. And once you recognize that, who else are you going to ask other than Allah? And therefore, making dua is a characteristic of faith, is a characteristic of iman. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Your Lord has commanded you, said to you, make dua to me, I will respond to you. This is a command from Allah, make dua, I will respond to you. And our Prophet ﷺ said, Verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angry at the person who does not ask him. Allah is angry at such a person because he's showing arrogance. He's showing a sense of superiority. And how can a'udhu billah, any created being, show an iota of pride, show an atom's weight of superiority against the divine? How is this even possible? So, the mu'min is ever making dua. The mu'min is making dua for each and every need of his. The mu'min is always engaged. Dua is a conversation with Allah. Dua is our conversation with Allah. And therefore, the one whose iman is high is forever having a conversation. Dua is a sign of iman. Why is this? Because when you make dua, brothers and sisters, when you make dua, imagine the state of the person making dua. Imagine somebody who's in a crisis, whose son or daughter is in a, a, a situation, they need a, a cure, they need something. Imagine that person. His heart is penitent and humble. 
His soul is reaching up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is raising his hands forth. And he is saying, Oh my Lord, oh my Rabb, I need your help. Oh my Lord, help my son. Ya Rabb, do this for me. This is a man, his heart is filled with love for Allah. He knows that Allah loves him. He knows that the only being who can give him what he wants is Allah. He knows that this is a Lord who is Rahman and Rahim. If he wasn't Rahman, he wouldn't be asking him. If he wasn't Rahim, he wouldn't give him what he wanted. He knows that this is a Lord who is Samir and Alim. If he wasn't Samir, if he wasn't all hearing, how could he ask? If he wasn't Al Alim, how could he pray? He knows this is a Lord who is Kareem, who is generous. Therefore, the one who makes dua affirms the perfect nature of Allah. The one who makes dua affirms the perfect nature of Allah. Each and every name and attribute of Allah is affirmed when you make dua. My Lord is ever hearing, all seeing, all merciful. My Lord loves me. My Lord cares about me. My Lord has the power to give me what I want. That's why I'm invoking him. When this person makes dua, his heart is full of love for Allah. His heart is full of hope in Allah's mercy, hope in acceptance. And his heart is full of, of fear of rejection, being scared that Allah might not answer the dua. Love, fear, and hope are the three motivational factors of worship. Hub, khawf, and raja. These three factors are what make a Muslim a Muslim. We worship Allah because we love Allah. We worship Allah because we want Allah's rahmah and we want His mercy. And we worship Allah because we're scared of His punishment and anger. When we make dua, we perfect all three of these aspects. We worship, we make dua to the one whom we love. We make dua wanting this being to give us, that's hope. And we make dua and we're scared, what if He doesn't? And that's fear. And these three pillars are the perfection of one's iman. If you notice, other actions of worship don't combine those three pillars like dua does. When we're in prostration, this is pre pre predominantly a type of, if you like, humility or humbleness. When we give zakah, this is predominantly wanting some reward back. We give some money, we want Allah to give us back. Predominantly hope. When we pray tahajjud, it's predominantly we hope so, for some reward. Hardly any action of worship combines these three pillars like dua does. Hardly any action of worship combines these three pillars like dua does. Love and hope and fear. Also, of the benefits of the story of Adam and Iblis, is that there are different types of dua. We learn that there are different types of dua. Adam, he asks a dua and Iblis asks a dua. Adam asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what? رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِن لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُنَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ He asks Allah for تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا مَغْفِرَ أَنْ رَحْمَ i.e. primarily spiritual. What was the dua of Iblis? Give me life until the day of judgment. Once again we notice a big contrast. Adam's worried about the soul. Iblis is worried about the body. Adam is worried about the deen. Iblis is worried about the dunya. Therefore, the mu'min is one who primarily is concentrating on the spiritual needs. That of the akhirah, of maghfirah, of rahmah. And the one who only concentrates on this world, this is a problem. It's not the methodology of the prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقٍ there are those who say, Oh Allah, we want of this world. Oh Allah, give me a good house. Oh Allah, give me a good spouse. Oh Allah, give me a, a good car. He keeps on asking. But his mind never comes to, Oh Allah, save me from the punishment on the day of judgment. Oh Allah, give me a, a, a place in paradise. Oh Allah, forgive my sin. His mind is always thinking of this dunya. So Allah says, he asks of this dunya, he will get it. But because he didn't ask for the akhirah, وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقٍ he has no share of the, of the hereafter. He wasn't concerned. وَمِنْهُمْ But there's another category of people. And these are the people we're supposed to be amongst. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولْ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Give us good in this world. Give us good in the next. And save us from the punishment of the fire. Three du'as. Two of them for the akhirah, one for this world. Of course we ask Allah for this dunya. Of course we do. But our primary concerns, our primary worries and fears are for the eternal afterlife. 
Yes, we want to enjoy our 60, 70 years on earth, if even we get that. But can we ignore the 60 billion or the eternal years after that? I mean, imagine, we're so worried about these 60, 70 years. How about the eternity after these, these years? The wise person is he who understands that that is the real life. The Darul Akhirah is the true life. If they only understood. So here is another difference. Brothers and sisters, if you find that every time you raise your hand, you're only asking for a pay raise from Allah, this is a problem. This is a problem. Yes, ask for a pay raise from Allah. You should ask for a pay raise. But make sure you add two thirds of your du'as as the Quranic ratio if you like, right? Majority of your du'as, Oh Allah, guide me. Ihdina salat al-mustaqeem. Oh Allah, forgive my sins. Oh Allah, make me blessed wherever I am. Oh Allah, protect me from evil. Oh Allah, do this and that. And yes, of course, you ask for dunya as well. But this is the difference, another difference between Adam and Iblis. Of the benefits of this story, and this is a really profound benefit of the story, is that even Adam, sorry, even Iblis, even Iblis makes dua to Allah. Even Iblis makes dua to Allah. And this really makes us wonder that is it not amazing that there are people on this earth who make dua to other than Allah? Even Iblis was not that much of a fool that he made dua to a rock or a stone or a dead person or a saint or a grave. Can you believe Iblis understood there's no point calling a dead person. There's no point invoking an angel. Because Iblis, despite his kufr, he understood that if anybody's going to give me what I want, it's going to be Allah. Nobody else has that power to give me what I want. Wallahi, it is distressing to see people who claim to say la ilaha illallah, and yet they are calling angels. They're calling prophets. They're calling saints. Ya so-and-so madad. Ya so-and-so cure my child. Subhanallah, where is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Even Iblis realizes that the only being who can give me what I want is Allah. He didn't make dua to Jibreel. He didn't make dua to Mikail. He didn't make dua to a host of other beings he could have. So how foolish is the one who is even more foolish than Iblis in this regard? And this is the benefits of this story. Of the benefits of this story is that it shows that those who turn to Allah only at times of need are not true believers. Iblis turned to Allah when he needed him. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اخرج منها فإنك رجيم Get out of here! You are going to be accursed. وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكَ لَعْنَةِ إِلَى يَوْمِ الدِّينَ And you shall have my curse until the day of judgment. Then when the situation has become completely desperate, Iblis calls out and he says, Oh Allah, give me just one life until the day of judgment. Give me, allow me to live. In a situation of desperation, brothers and sisters, even Iblis remembers Allah. This is the moral of the story. In the situation of desperation, even Iblis remembers Allah. It's easy to think of God when you're in distress, when you lose your job, when you're in an accident, when a loved one dies. Oh God, help me. Oh Allah, cure me. That's not a sign of Iman necessarily. Iblis does the same. The sign of Iman is to worship Allah and thank Him even at times of ease. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the mushrikeen of Mecca, the pagans of Mecca, even they would make dua to Allah at times of distress. فَإِذَا رَكِبُوا فِي الْفُلْكِ دَعَوَ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ When they're about to drown in the ocean, when they see the waves coming, they say, Oh Allah, save us. If you only save us, O oh Allah, we will be so thankful to you. O oh Allah, please do this for me. You will see how good I am. The minute Allah saves them, they turn away. Brothers and sisters, next time you're in a situation of crisis, remember Allah. That's the human nature. Remember Allah. But then remember, to really be a mu'min, you have to continue that remembrance beyond just a time of crisis. You have to continue that worship, continue that relationship beyond just that moment of need. You always need Allah. It's only that sometimes you realize that need more. That's really all it is. You always need Allah. Even at times of good, at times of, of, of happiness and joy, you need Allah. But unfortunately, that joy blinds you and you don't realize you need Him. 
And unfortunately, it's only at times of distress we are reminded of Allah. This is human nature. So in and of itself, to be reminded of Allah at times of distress, this is human nature across the board. But the difference is the mu'min always has that relationship with Allah. Whereas Iblis even has a relationship at times of distress. So yet another moral that we learn from this story. Yet another moral that we learn, and by the way, this also, the Prophet ﷺ told us about this. The Prophet ﷺ said in authentic hadith, whoever desires that Allah respond to his dua at times of distress, let him increase his dua at times of ease. I repeat, whoever desires that his dua be responded to at times of distress, let him increase his dua at times of need, at times of ease. Why? Because when you're in a good situation, an easy situation, and you're always having a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah sees, this is a servant who loves me. This is a servant who believes in me. This is a servant who realizes that without me, he is nothing. And therefore, when the situation comes that you need something desperately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer that. As the saying goes, if you keep on knocking, eventually somebody's going to open the door. We're always knocking at the door of Allah. Always! We just don't realize that sometimes we need that door to be visibly open to us. Wa illa, the, the fact of the matter is Allah's door always has to be open for us, for us to live on this earth. But sometimes we need to see that door open. Sometimes we need that little miracle in our lives. So he who continually knocks will eventually see that. Therefore, establish your relationship with Allah at times of ease. And Allah will know you at times of hardship. This is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said. Know Allah and establish your relationship at times of ease. And Allah will know you at times of hardship. Of the benefits of this story is that both Adam and Iblis ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something great, something magnificent. Something that is very big. Adam alayhi salam, can you imagine being in the shoes of our father Adam? Can you imagine you were given Jannah and you were given more fruits and more uh, luscious, if you like, uh, paradise than you can imagine? And the only thing that Allah has made haram is one tree. You can eat kula minha raghadan haythu shi'tuma. Raghada means go ahead and eat as much as you want, bountifully. In Jannah, there is no digestive problem. You don't have to worry about getting rid of the food, right? That food, it fully digests inside of you. In Jannah, you can eat and eat and eat, and you don't need to worry about your stomach filling up. You eat for the pleasure of eating. That's the beauty of Jannah. So Allah tells Adam, go ahead, you and your wife, and go ahead and enjoy everything in Jannah. Can you imagine out of the billions and billions and billions of fruits and vegetables and whatever there was there, just one tree is forbidden and Adam eventually eats from it. Imagine how mortified, how embarrassed he must be that Allah Azza wa Jalla just told him one tree and he still ate from it. Nonetheless, he doesn't lose hope in Allah. And he raises his hands up to Allah and he says, Oh Allah, you have to forgive me. If you don't forgive me, I will be perished. There's no other hope for me. Iblis as well, he asks Allah something that nobody else has ever asked or gotten or received. He asks Allah not for eternal life, only Allah has eternal life. He asks Allah for the longest life of any created being. No human and no other jinn will live as long as Iblis. No human and no other jinn. Right now Iblis is alive. And he was alive Allah knows how many millennia ago. And he shall remain alive until the trumpet is blown. No other jinn even has that that. If you like, it's a, it's a curse for him, but otherwise it is a blessing that Allah might have given to somebody. For him, it's a curse. Nobody else. In other words, he asked Allah for something big, and Allah gave it to him. Both Adam and Iblis, they ask Allah for something huge. Therefore, don't be shy or embarrassed to ask Allah for something magnificent, for something that is extremely big, because you are asking Allahu Akbar. You're asking the one who is bigger than anything you can imagine. Our Prophet Sallallahu said, ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for everything because Allah responds to the dua of the one who asks. So the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, if, if Allah will respond for everything that we ask, إِذَنْ nastakthir. We are going to ask kathir, nastakthir. We're going to do more and more and more. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiled and he said, Allahu Akthar. Allah is more than what you can ask for. Allahu Akthar. 
What, do you think you're gonna, you're gonna take up the resources of Allah? You, you measly, puny one individual? You will overpower the mercy of Allah? Who do you think you are that you single-handedly can fill up all of Allah's resources? Do you understand how arrogant it sounds when you think, oh, that's too big, Allah won't give that to me. You are underestimating Allah. وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ They didn't give an estimation of Allah the way that He deserves. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the famous hadith in Sahih Muslim, in which the Prophet says in a hadith Qudsi that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibadi, O oh my servants, law anna awalakum wa akhirakum, if the first of you and the last of you, wa insakum wa jinnakum, and the men of you and the jinn of you, ganu ala sa'idin wahid, they stood up at a one particular place in time, and each one of them asked me whatever was in his heart. The first of you and the last of you, the Muslim of you and the Kafir of you, the men of you and the women of you, the, the, the jinn of you and the ins of you. If each and every creation stood up on one plane, at one time, at one place, and simultaneously asked me everything they could possibly imagine and think of, and I gave every one of them what they wanted, what does Allah say? My kingdom would not be diminished except like an ocean is diminished when a needle is taken and then taken out of it. My kingdom would not be diminished. And the scholars say, even this, don't take it literally. Because when you put a needle into the ocean, some molecules come out. Something comes out. Allah's kingdom is infinite because this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, brothers and sisters, ask and ask plentifully. Plentifully, because Aisha radiallahu anha said, whatever happens, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much so, she said, so much so, that if your shoelace breaks, make dua that Allah replaces it. Because, she said, if Allah has not willed to replace it, it will never be replaced. If your shoelace breaks, make dua, oh Allah, give me another shoelace. Because if Allah has not willed that you don't get another shoelace, you ain't getting any of their shoelace, brothers. It's quite simple. It has to be in Allah's qadr. So if you don't have that dua in you, this is a problem. So we ask Allah, and we ask Allah, and we ask Allah. And the more we ask Allah, the more our iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases. This story also shows us of the benefits of this story. Is that every single sincere dua is responded to. Even if it comes from a kafir, even if it comes from iblis. Why? Because Allah is the Rabb, not just of the Muslim, but of the non-Muslim. Allah is the Rabb, not just of the ins, but of the jinn. Allah is the Rabb of each and every living being, each and every creature, each and every bird and animal. Even if that being, in his arrogance, denies Allah, it doesn't change the fact that Allah is that being's Rabb. Even if he denies it verbally. And therefore, as a sign of perfection, when this being calls out to Allah, sincerely, Allah will give this being what he desires and wants. Even if he denies him. Surely, if Iblis's dua can be accepted, surely my dua and your dua has more of a chance. I mean, I know I'm evil and you're evil, but we're not as bad as Iblis, right? Inshallah, right? That's an inshallah, yani ta'liq ala tahqiz. We're not as bad as Iblis, right? So if Iblis's dua can be, expect, can be accepted, surely my dua and your dua has more of a right of being accepted by Allah. Don't lose hope. Don't lose your optimism in Allah giving your dua. The Prophet ﷺ said, there is no one who asks Allah for anything sincerely except that Allah gives it to him. As long as it's something that is Good. I, you don't ask for evil, obviously. Ask for something that is halal and tayyib. There is no one that asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives it to him. The scholars say Allah responds to his dua, but in ways that maybe you don't understand. Somebody will say, last year I wanted that job interview and I kept on making dua, I didn't get it. This hadith can't be true, astaghfirullah. Somebody says, last year I was really interested in a particular sister making dua and tahajjud. Oh Allah, please, oh Allah, please. She turned me down. I didn't get what I want. How is this possible? The response is very simple. The Prophet ﷺ said his dua will be mustajab. Mustajab. Allah will give him some type of response. The response might be different than what you expect. But it will be responded. This is the key point. You will get something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you ask properly, what can you get? Well, 
either Allah gives you what you want, and that's what we expect, right? That's our narrow minds. We only think of one track. Oh Allah, I want this job. We don't get it. Why didn't I get the job? We don't understand Allah might have done something else. What could He have done else? Your dua can be responded to by number two. Number one is giving you what you want. Number two, giving you something better than it without you realizing it. You wanted job A, Allah gave you job B and that was better for you in the long run. You didn't realize it. But because you made dua sincerely and Allah knew you wanted good, Allah gave you something that was better. You in your narrow mind, in your limited vision, are questioning the wisdom of Allah. And you know what? Let me be very frank with you, brothers and sisters. I want you to think about your life and the years that Allah has given you on this earth. I want you to think about some type of calamity, some type of disappointment back in your life five years ago, two years ago, and then ask yourself, in the long run, wasn't that musibah for my good? Think about it. In the long run, wasn't every single turn that I took in my life the best for me. That's why I'm sitting here today. That's why I am where I am and I am who I am. Every single thing that happened to me, when it happened, I might have thought, why is this happening? What is the wisdom? But now I see. Now I understand. This is the true mu'min. He understands that whatever happens, happens for a divine wisdom. Number three, number one, he gives you what you want. Number two, he gives you something better than what you wanted. You wanted to marry a particular sister, Allah bless you with somebody better than her. Number three, Allah might avert away an evil that was otherwise destined for you because of your dua. Simply because you raised your hands and made dua, some calamity is el eliminated from your life. So in the end of the day, your dua is mustajab. How can it not be when Allah has guaranteed it in the Quran? وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ This is a simple condition. You can't get simpler in the Arabic language. Ud'uni, make dua to me. Astajib lakum, I shall respond to you. In Arabic, this is called shart wa jawabu. It's a conditional clause. You make a condition, Allah makes a condition. You make dua, Allah will give you. Allah has promised you, brothers and sisters. Allah has promised all of us. If we make dua, Allah will give us. The question is, in our narrow minds, we don't understand that giving. Sometimes Allah gives us more, but we're so blind, we're so narrow, we're still waiting for that one thing. And Allah might have blessed us with a hundred things better than the one thing we're looking for. In fact, it is very possible that that one thing we wanted would have caused us harm, would have caused us problems. And Allah in His mercy, because of our sincere dua, took it away from us. We, our, our vision is limited. We think something is good. We think something is so necessary. And Allah knows better than us. Therefore, brothers and sisters, never give up hope of your dua being answered. Your dua has been answered. It has been. Allah has guaranteed it. It's only a matter of our narrow-minded and understandingness. The Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah hayiyun kareem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hayi, which means he is shy. Kareem, he is generous. Yastahyi min abdihi. He is Shy, now when we say these attributes, we affirm them in a manner that Allah knows. Allah's shyness and generosity, only Allah knows how. These are mere words that are expressing divine characteristics. We'll never fully comprehend them. This is a human language that we're using. We'll never understand how the reality of these things. But we understand the concept of shyness, the concept of generosity. How is Allah shy? Allah knows how. But there is something that the Prophet said, Allah is hayi. How is he hayi? He explained to us what is the meaning of it in, in the case of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, he is hayi, he is shy, that when his servants raise his hands up to him, that he allows these hands to come back down empty. This is the shyness of Allah. You know when we're walking in the street and a beggar comes up and he says, please, I'm a homeless person, please, you know, my wife and kids are sick, please give me ten dollars, keeps on begging and pleading. Wallahi, a person with an ounce of, forget iman, dignity, an ounce of, of respect, even if he doesn't give money, he'll feel, what will he feel? Shyness, awkwardness, I should give something. You know, that feeling. Walillahi al al-a'la, to Allah belongs the perfect example. If this is how we feel when somebody asks and keeps on asking, Allah is all perfect. And when his own servants raise his hands up to him, Allah is hayi to allow those hands to come back down with nothing in them. Brothers and sisters, 
Why then are we not raising our hands to Allah day and night? Why then are we not, are we not eager for Allah's mercy? The Prophet Musa alayhi salam says, قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي لَمْ أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فقير. Musa says, Rabbi, I am faqeer. For you, O oh Allah, for your mercy, I am faqeer. If Musa is a beggar in front of Allah, what does that make me and you? If Musa, Kalimullah, says, I am a beggar, O oh Allah, for your mercy. I get whatever I want and I'm happy at that. I am a faqeer to you, O oh Allah. Where do me and you stand when it comes to that? Why don't we raise our hands more often to Allah when our Lord is so generous, when our Lord is hayy? What is preventing us from getting more and more blessings? Every time we raise our hands up to Allah, have yaqeen, brothers and sisters, that your hands are coming back down with some gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe in a generous Lord. We believe in a loving Lord. We believe in a caring Lord. Well then, why don't we show that belief by making dua to Him? And by the way, just a side point, a lot of people make a mistake when they put their hands up. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ud'u Allah bi butuni wa kuffikum. Make dua with the inner side of your palms and not with the outer side. What this means is we make dua and our palms should be asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best way to make dua is to have the palms straight out, literally like a beggar. Oh Allah, we want from you. Some people make a mistake and they make, they turn it around or they make it like this and they ask Allah from the back and the Prophet explicitly said, don't ask Allah from the back of your palms. It's not the polite way. You don't ask like this. So the proper way to ask you lower and some people they go like this, this is fine, but even better, you want to show how much you need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want Allah to show, she, you, this is my poverty, this is my faqr to you, O oh Allah. So you literally lay your hands out and you say, O oh Allah, this is what I want. And the Prophet would raise his hands to Allah sometimes in times of extreme desperation, such as the battle of Uhud so, uh, and, and the battle of Badr. Sometimes he would raise his hands all the way up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is rare when the situation is dire. Otherwise, generally, he would raise his hands up to Allah to a chest level and his hands would be flat. And it is also narrated that sometimes he would make dua without raising his hand. So it's not a condition that you raise your hands. If you would just want to say, La ilaha illa subhanak inni kuntu min al something, some dua like this, you may say it without necessarily raising your hands. Raising your hands is of the etiquette of dua, it's not a necessary condition of dua. In this, uh, in this story of Adam and Iblis, we learn that the single greatest factor to have your dua accepted is being sincere and earnest. This is the single greatest factor. The number one factor that guarantees your dua to be accepted is you ask Allah, as we say in English, from the depths of your heart, from the bottom of yours. You ask Allah sincerely. When you ask Allah in that manner, well then even Iblis got what he wanted. Sincerity is the number one factor that has that causes our du'as to be answered by Allah. And this is another moral and blessing that we learn from this story. Of the lessons that we learn from the story is that du'a has certain etiquettes. Du'a has certain etiquettes. And of these etiquettes is the realization, the yaqeen, that Allah Azza wa Jal is the one and only one who can give us what we want. Believe it or not, even Iblis had this yaqeen. That's why he asked Allah, didn't he, right? Believe it or not, even Iblis had this yaqeen. So to have yaqeen that Allah will give me what I want. And this is a sense of trust in Allah, a sense of optimism. To put our trust in other than Allah, that's not a part of Tawheed. Putting your trust in Allah and being optimistic. The Prophet ﷺ said, Make dua to Allah while you have yaqeen that Allah will give you what you want. Being optimistic in Allah is a sign of faith. So when we make dua to Allah, we think the best thoughts about Allah. And we think, oh Allah, you're going to give. Allah will give me what I want. And if you don't get what you want, realize what you got might be better than what you wanted. What you're blind to, what you're oblivious to, might be Allah's response to you. And you're ignoring that. You're asking for a particular job, and mashallah, your family life becomes better, and your health is good, and everything. And you're only worried about the job, and you don't realize Allah is blessing you in a million other ways. And you're saying, why isn't my dua answered? And Allah has already answered your dua, and given you much more than you're asking for, and you're blind to this. So have, make dua when you have yaqeen in that dua. Of the etiquettes of dua, making dua for things that are good and pure. 
And that's why the Prophet said, as long as you ask for the pure, Allah will give it to you. We don't obviously make dua for evil things. Of the etiquettes of dua, purity of sustenance. Purity of sustenance. What caused Adam to fall from grace, to fall from his great status that he was in, except haram sustenance. That was what caused him to fall into it. And therefore he had to repent to Allah. And that is why the Prophet wasallam said, it is possible that a traveler is traveling in the desert, dusty and tired. He doesn't have the food and the drink that he needs. And he raises his hands up to Allah and he says, Oh Rabb, I want this and I want that. It is part. Now, why is the Prophet saying this? Because when you're traveling, when you're in a tired state, when you're hungry, these are situations where Allah typically will have mercy on you. These are situations where typically your dua will be responded to. However, the Prophet ﷺ said, here is a man, he has all of these conditions and he's making dua to Allah. وَمَطْعَمُهُ حَرَامٌ وَمَشْرَبُهُ حَرَامٌ وَمَلْبَسُهُ حَرَامٌ وَغُذِّيَ بِالْحَرَامٌ His eating is haram, his drinks are haram, the food he's wearing is haram, his sustenance and money is haram. فَأَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ لَهُ How does he think Allah will respond to him? Eating haram and earning haram money is one of the greatest impediments between you and your dua. When you earn haram money, it is as if there is a barrier, a block between you and your du'as. Your du'as are not raised up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet is saying, what a foolish man this is that he thinks his du'a will be responded to. فَأَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ لَهُ How? I mean, how does he think his du'a will be responded to? Brothers and sisters, make sure that our income is halal. Make sure that every single penny we earn, make sure that every single dollar that we earn is an honest dollar. It's a true, it's a money that we can be proud of on the day of judgment and not something that we're embarrassed or ashamed about. And this is a problem in this, especially this world that we live in, especially this part of the world that we live in. But the mu'min is the one who tries to abstain from as much as he can and asks Allah Azza wa Jal to forgive the rest. Of the etiquette that we learn, especially in the dua of Adam now, is to beseech and to cry and to show desperation to Allah. To show desperation to Allah. Look at the dua of Adam. رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِن لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُنَّا مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Oh Allah, I've wronged myself. If you don't forgive me, if you don't have mercy, I will be destroyed. I will be of those who are lost. We notice a plea, a call, a desperation. So of the etiquettes of dua, to be that desperate, to show Allah how much you need Him. Of the etiquettes of dua, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with His names and attributes. Adam, he says, Rabbana ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا What does Iblis say? قَالَ أَنظِرْنِي إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ He said, allow me to live. It's a, more of a command than a dua. أَنظِرْنِي إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ Whereas Adam says, قَالَ رَبَّنَا Oh my Rabb. So one of the differences, when we make dua to Allah, we invoke Allah using His names, using His attributes. And therefore, it is the sign of a mu'min that he memorizes the names of Allah and he uses them in his dua. Allah says in the Quran, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ Allah says in the Quran, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا To your Lord belongs the most beautiful names, so make dua to Allah using those names. فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا Therefore, any need of yours that you have, think, what is the name that is the most appropriate for my need? What is the name that is the most appropriate for what I want? If you want to be forgiven, you say, Ya Ghaffar, Ya Ghafoor, Ya Rahman, Ya Afu, Ya Tawwab. If you want something of this world, Ya Kareem, Ya Mannan. If you want to be cured, Ya Shafi. If you want a child, Ya Wahab, and so on and so forth. There is nothing that you can think of except that you will find a name or an attribute that links to your cause. So you appeal to Allah using His names, using His attributes. And the greatest name in a dua is Rabb. The greatest name in a dua is Rabb. Why? Because Rabb is the most comprehensive. You are invoking the one who will take care of you, who is in charge of you, who is your master. Who else do you turn to except your master and your Lord? Rabb, you are my Rabb. I don't have any Rabb besides you. Rabb, you are my Rabb. You're supposed to take care of me. If, I don't, if you don't take care of me, I have no other alternative. So we make dua using the, the names of Allah. Of the etiquettes of dua, and inshallah we'll finish in 5-10 minutes inshallah. Of the etiquettes of dua is to recognize your own faults when you call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does Adam start his dua? 
قال ربنا ظلمنا انفسنا او oh الله i acknowledge that i am not worthy of this O oh Allah, I realize that I have committed a sin. O oh Allah, here I am in front of you, standing with my hands raised, bowing down in front of you, prostrating. I know my sins, O oh Allah. I have wronged myself. I know that I don't deserve this mercy from you. Yet I still ask you, O oh Allah, because if I don't ask you, who else am I going to ask? I know that I'm not worthy, and yet still I stand because I have no other alternative. You are my Rabb, O oh Allah. Please overlook my sins and give me what I want. This should be the perpetual attitude of the mu'min, ever realizing that I am not worthy of those blessings, yet I still need them. I am embarrassed to ask you, Allah, but I must ask you. I know my sins. My sins are many, but your rahmah, O oh Allah, is more than my sins. And I put my trust in you that you are the forgiving, you are the merciful, you will take care of me, and you will overlook my sins. Zalamna anfusana. Acknowledge your mistakes in front of Allah. How dare I ask Allah knowing my sins? The same hands that I'm raising to Allah, how many sins have they committed? The same tongue that I'm asking Allah, how much lies and how much ghibah have they done? The same eyes that are now begging and pleading Allah, how much have they seen that is haram? And yet I am still asking Allah because there's no other choice for me. I have no other alternative. Oh Allah, you know that and I testify to this. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al This is the attitude of the believer. And that is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sayyidul istighfar, the best dua of forgiveness that you can ever ask. The Sayyid or the queen of all other duas is to say, Oh Allah, I am your servant and the son of your servant. O oh Allah, I acknowledge the sins that I have committed. Abu ulaka, I acknowledge the sins that I have committed. And I acknowledge the good that you have done to me. So forgive me. Acknowledging your sins, admitting to Allah, who am I? And yet, who else can I ask except you? This attitude is the attitude of Adam alayhi salam. This is the attitude of the prophets of Allah. And therefore, this is something that we too should emulate and, uh, and imitate. Of the etiquettes of dua, of the etiquettes of dua is the realization that dua is the crux of our worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dua is the crux of our worship. Dua is the, is the backbone. That's exactly what the Prophet said. A du'a'u mukhul ibadah. Now, mukh is usually translated as brains, but the meaning of mukh is more than brains. It's the backbone. It is the gist, it's the central pillar. There's a hadith. A du'a'u mukhul ibadah. Du'a is the gist, it is the backbone of ibadah. So to be a true servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be a righteous servant of Allah, we would better have a strong backbone. We better have a strong base and increase this etiquette of dua. Let me conclude by stating that dua is the heart of worship. It is the foundation of worship. It is the pillar of worship. It, it demonstrates in clear terms the inherent helplessness, the faqr of man. And it demonstrates the rububiyya and the uluhiyya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let us ask ourselves, what is the status of dua in my life? How often do I turn to Allah? For what do I turn to Him? What is the state of mind when I turn to Him? Do I just utter phrases from a book, open up a book and say, Rabbana, 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 I have no idea what I'm saying? That's not dua. That's not dua. The Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal does not answer dua min qalbin ghafil, from a, a, a qalb that is, that is heedless, it's not paying attention. It's not dua that you simply read a paper, you have no idea what says it on it. No. You make dua to Allah from your heart, even if it's in your own tongue, brothers and sisters, by unanimous consensus of all the scholars of Islam. There is no ikhtilaf here. Dua can be made in any language. Allah understands all languages. Dua can be made in any language. It's not that you only can say it in Arabic. If you haven't memorized Arabic du'as, say it in Urdu, in, in Swahili, in, uh, in Gujarati, in any language you speak, say it in English. Allah understands all languages. No scholar on earth has ever made a condition that dua has to be given in Arabic. Dua is something that comes from the heart. If you haven't memorized duas from the Quran and Sunnah, okay, that's not good. You should memorize more. But in the meantime, use your heart. And let your heart speak to Allah Azza wa directly. Speak from the heart because that is when you will be sincere. So let your heart speak to Allah in this conversation. And Allah is responding, brothers and sisters, because even if... Even if you cannot hear Allah, Allah is hearing you. 
Even if you cannot hear Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hearing you. And I conclude by quoting a beautiful, a beautiful uh, statement from one of our classical scholars of Islam, Ibrahim ibn Adham. Ibrahim ibn Adham was a famous student of uh, the Tabi'un, and he was a worshipper and an alim. And Ibrahim ibn, ibn Adham was respected and admired by all of the people of his time for being a true servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So once a man came to him and said, O oh, Ibrahim ibn Adham, why is it that I make dua to Allah and Allah does not respond to my duas? So Ibrahim ibn Adam made a famous statement, a famous paragraph, if you like, which became so, if you like, profound that has been memorized and reported by many hundreds and thousands of people up until our times. He replied, because you know Allah, but you don't obey Him. And you know the Prophet wasallam, but you do not follow his sunnah. And you read the Quran, but you don't act upon it. And you eat from the blessings of Allah, but you ignore it and do not thank Him for it. And you believe in paradise, yet you do not strive for it. And you know the fire of hell, yet you do not run away from it. And you know shaitan, yet you do not fight it. And you know death, yet you do not prepare for it. You know all of these things, but what have you done with all of this knowledge? Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ when my servants ask you about me, tell them, I am qareeb to them. I am close to them. Why is Allah qareeb? How is Allah qareeb? What is the meaning of Allah qareeb? Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قريب. When my servants ask you, then Allah responds. He doesn't say, say to them. He responds, I am close to them. How? أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دعان. I respond to the dua of the one who makes dua when he makes dua. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al qareeb The only time that Allah mentions this name in the Quran, one of Allah's names is al qareeb The only time Allah mentions al qareeb is when it comes to dua. Allah is al qareeb when you make dua. Allah is al qareeb when you call out to Him. Allah is al qareeb when you invoke Him. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دعان. I respond and I give the one who makes dua when he makes dua. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُ بِي Let them respond to me. Let them make dua to me. Let them believe in me. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ If they truly wish to be guided. If we want to be guided, if we want to be believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let us increase in our dua. Let us increase in the quantity and the quality of our dua. Let us make dua in the morning and in the evening. Let us make dua for our deen and our dunya. Let us make dua for ourselves and our children and our families and our forefathers. Let us make dua for the entire Muslim ummah and one when we do so, and only when we do so, we are demonstrating to Allah that we have that iota of iman, that sense of trust, that sense of humility and humbleness in Him. In the end of the day, we are faqir to Allah's rahmah. We are faqir to everything Allah gives us. So we ask Allah for everything that we need. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and guide through us. May He forgive our sins. May He accept our duas. May He cause us to be amongst those who are righteous and whose dua is listened to. May He cause us to eat and drink only the pure. May He forgive our sins and cause us to be amongst the, the righteous and the Nabiin and the Siddiqeen and the Shuhada.